Hafiz. Uh, today we are really happy to host um, Professor Christine Jacobsen, who's a professor of social anthropology and also the director of the Center for Women and Gender Studies at the University of Bergen. Um, um, Christine currently heads the research project uh, on waiting for an uncertain future. Uh, and the subtitle is The Temporalities of Irregular Migration and the work package also in the EU funded project, The Right to International Protection, a pendulum between globalization and nativization, question mark. She also conducts ethnography in Norway and France uh, between, um, and she has published <clears throat> extensively on topics such as migration, Islam in Europe, secularism, feminism, multiculturalism, sex work, and irregular migration. And um, she is going to talk to us today um, about uh, her last publication, which is, uh, for, I think it's just actually come out or about to come out, um, an edited volume uh, with the title of Waiting and the Temporalities of Irregular Migration. Uh, we are particularly happy to host Christine at this time of the year because um, in our MA program in um, migration, um, we have um, literally this week dealt with the issue of weight and stuckedness. And so uh, I know that uh, a lot of uh, our students are very much looking forward to, uh, to Christine's um, reflections on this uh, as someone has worked for the past five years on um, such topic. Um, the title of today's presentation is The Power Chronographies of Waiting for Asylum in Marseille, France. And so the floor is uh, yours, Christine. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Ruben. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak in this seminar series. Uh, I look very much forward to discussing my work uh, with you. Uh, as Ruba said, I will um, be building my presentation today on a research project that we just finished and that is called Waiting for an Uncertain Future, the Temporalities of Irregular Migration. Uh, and as Ruba also mentioned, um, we just published an edited volume um, on the basis of this project. It came out with uh, Routledge a week ago uh, and it's uh, available in um, uh, open access uh, version. You um, can distribute uh, the link if anyone's interested. Um, the book uh, proposes ways to develop waiting as an analytical lens in migration studies. Uh, through conceptualizing waiting as constituted in and through multiple and relational temporalities, uh, and also through highlighting the significance of the geopolitical and chronopolitical locations of waiting. Uh, and in the books, there are chapters that address the legal, bureaucratic, um, ethical, gendered, and affective dimensions of time and migration, among other things. Uh, it also includes uh, ethnographic uh, as well as other empirically based material, as well as theorizing that cross-cut uh, cross disciplinary boundaries. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present uh, some parts of, of uh, the from the introduction uh, to the edited volume uh, that I co-authored uh, co uh, with my colleague Mayam Carlson, uh, and then I'm going to present um, some material from my own chapter uh, in the book uh, based on an, my ethnographic studies in uh, Marseille in France. So while international migration involves human mobility across political borders and has been sophisticately analyzed in spatial terms, it also encompasses multiple layered and complex temporalities. And recently, as you know, migration scholars have begun to unpack the temporalities at stake in modes of governing migration and how complex temporalities shape migration experiences and practices. And the WAIT project is situated within this uh, temporal turn in migration studies. Our collaborative work uh, involving researchers with different disciplinary backgrounds and in different uh, geographical locations has aimed at providing critical knowledge about the social, social cultural dynamics of contemporary migration through foregrounding time as an analytical lens. The project has focused on the form of migration that tends to be labeled irregular referring to people whose entrance and or dwelling on state territory happens without formal, formal authorization. 
uh, notwithstanding the challenges of terminology and different uses, and uh, there are certainly a lot of discussions about which terminologies are the better to use in this context. The focus in the book is on migrants whose presence on state territory is somehow contested and or legally precarious. But rather than approaching irregular migrants as a generalized category, we have situated our analysis within distinct configurations of egality that are constituted within particular regimes of migration control, uh, as suggested by uh, De Genova as an approach, but also in everyday life beyond legal codes, uh, government policies and bureaucratic apparatuses. So investigating the temporalities of irregular migration, the project, as the name suggests, has further zoomed in on the question of waiting. In the project, we have approached waiting both as a social phenomenon that proliferates in irregular migration and as an analytical perspective on migration processes and practices. So we started from the observation that waiting seemed to be fundamental in the experience of irregularized migrants, as described in certain ethnographic works, um, and that it was becoming crucial also to representations in both public debate and scholarly work. Inspired by previous anthropological work on the social legal production of migrant illegality by, for instance, uh, Nicolas de Genova, who's also part of the WAIT project, our aim was to move beyond simply describing this uh, phenomenon and its effects, uh, towards also understanding how waiting is legally and socially produced and productive in particular social historical contexts. And uh, because uh, most of the literature that has been published in this field has a more sort of phenomenological um, intake to the study of waiting and focuses on experiences of waiting. So we wanted to introduce this uh, notion of, of the social legal production of waiting and, and how that unfolds. So using waiting as an analytical lens, we examined the complex and shifting nature of processes of bordering, belonging, state power, exclusion and inclusion, and social relations in migration. Aware that the analytical prism of waiting is prone to constructions of migrants as passive and without agency, uh, this is, has been a, a critique of some of the literature on waiting, we also used our ethnographic material to analyze how people encounter, oppose, or resist waiting through, for instance, uh, patience, endurance, waiting out, boredom, the use of technologies such as smartphones, and uh, true political mobilization. Now, some works had already analyzed waiting as a significant fact of mobility when we started the project, but there was a need to further explore waiting as a particular engagement in and with time. While waiting is an inescapable part of life in modern societies, and most people, if not all, experience multiple forms of waiting in our daily lives, Differences related to class, gender, race, and legal status position us differently within time and space. Existing literature has related waiting in irregular migration to the condition of political legal exclusion, often conceptualized as a form of protracted in-between time through concepts such as uh, liminality and limbo. Through our ethnographic work, we discovered that the temporalities of irregular migration are more diverse and complex than those widespread, uh, this widespread focus on limbo and liminality can lead us to think. Waiting by migrants involves different geographies, other people, and phases of life. It is constituted through timeframes related to the nation state and its efforts to control migration, but also to capitalism, labor, technologies, as well as to the temporalities of biological bodies in the shape of, for instance, aging and reproduction. Vulnerable groups are particularly exposed to multiple forms of waiting for different things at the same time, as among other uh, Gassan Haj has pointed out. In the context of migration and displacement, different objects of waiting and different types of waiting go parallel to each other and overlap one another. Waiting and migration can include both what we can call situational forms of waiting, including waiting for public services and bureaucratic decisions or the simple fact of just uh, standing in a queue, 
and more prolonged and open-ended forms of existential waiting for regularization, for justice, or for better futures. So to unpack these entanglements of waiting, we engaged theories of time to carve out an understanding of waiting and the temporalities of irregular migration as both multiple and relational. Taking temporal complexity seriously, we contend, involves attending to the relations between social framings of time, uh, including, for instance, abstract measures of time and routines associated with state bureaucracy, capitalist production, uh, social reproduction and cultural norms, and also to human experiences of time. To unpack such multiple and relational temporalities, we'd, we paid attention to structural elements of time, including such things as uh, tempo, rhythm, timing, duration, and directionality. We identified a number of temporal techniques that are variously deployed in migration control and involved in the production of waiting, such as, for instance, acceleration, deceleration, circulation, delay, suspension, sequencing, periodization, temporariness, and indeterminacy. Further, we paid attention to the relations between different temporalities by examining, for instance, processes of synchronization and recalibration, disjunctures and gaps. I'm gonna come back to some of these uh, concepts and exemplify some of the ways in which we're using them um, as I move on to my uh, ethnographic uh, discussion later. One particular concern and recurrent discussion in the project was um, how to deal with the often tacit normativities implied in the concept of waiting. Developing the concept of waiting analytically, we discovered that the underpinnings of the concept risk reproducing certain normative structures. In unpacking these normative underpinnings, many of us were inspired by feminist and queer work, problematizing ideas of temporal homogeneity, linearity, and progress. Waiting is deeply enmeshed in modern conceptions about linear time and progress. In modern societies, time is associated with success and money and approached in terms of how it it's most efficiently can be used. Um, in this context, waiting symbolizes waste, emptiness and useless, uh, uh, uselessness. Uh, the idea of waiting also risks reproducing nationalist framings of irregular migrants' futures as a question solely of inclusion into the nation state. In many accounts of irregular migrants' political legal exclusion, exclusion the state assumes the position as uh, what we could call the redemptive endpoint to waiting. So, uh, Karianne Drangsland, for instance, in her chapter, shows how migrants' time in the German context is conjured up to futures defined by the state and its economic and demographic concerns. Such account ignore migrants' relations to different geographies, temporalities, and other people, and other possible futures than inclusion into the nation state and existing political legal configurations of membership. So analyzing waiting as a particular engagement in and with time in migration entails an engagement and critical exploration of how different presents and futures are conjured into being. Uh, a third risk that I want to mention with uh, the uh, using uh, waiting as an analytical uh, perspective is that it also risks reproducing particular gendered and heteronormative life cycle expectations and expectations of productivity and development, including marriage, parenthood, and paid labor. There is thus a need to further problematize the gender, sexual, class, and racialized norms that are often implicitly found in ideas about lives put on hold. On hold from what? Be it from particular life cycle expectations or expectations of productivity and development. So the authors in this volume, they seek to acknowledge migrants' experiences of waiting and having their lives put on hold, but without reinscribing such gendered, sexual, class, or racialized normativities. 
the temporal ideas of norms of progress, development, of becoming an adult, growing up, uh, underpinning experiences and account of waiting are thus unpacked as part of the analysis in the book. So rather than taking the normative times of capitalism, nationalism, and the heteronormative family for granted, and seeing irregular migrants as outside of or excluded by these social temporalities, weight researchers have paid attention also to how weighting may serve to open spaces for new subjectivities and relations. So <clears throat> I want to move on now um, to present some of my own work, which is also one of the chapters uh, in the book. The chapter is based on several periods of fieldwork conducted between 2012 and 2018 in Marseille. During this period, migration to France was marked by movements onset by the so-called Arab Spring and protracted conflicts in Africa and the Middle East, particularly the war in Syria. In the chapter, I zoom in on migrants who had sought, who were in the process of seeking, or who intended to seek uh, regularization under the asylum law and who had a precarious legal status um, at the time uh, of my research project. Um, I conducted interviews with migrants and activists, representatives of non-governmental organizations and public officials working uh, with migrants. Uh, but more than anything, participant observation uh, was crucial to gaining a thicker understanding of how waiting is both produced and experienced. Being with migrants in time spaces of waiting and accompanying them in their struggles to get um, to regularize their legal status or to get by importantly attuned me to both the material and effective conditions of waiting. And I use that also as an intake uh, to my analysis. Thus, I based the following analysis on, analysis on research processes grounded in reflexive contextualization, co-presence and cooperation with the people whose lived experience um, I base my analysis on here. Now, in thinking about waiting and temporalities as multiple and relational, I have been very much, I personally have been very much inspired by Sarah Sharma's work, uh, and in particular, the concept of power chronography and temporal architectures. Uh, Sharma extends Doreen Massey's seminal theory of power uh, geometry to point to how not only spatiality and mobility, but also temporality is both shaped by and reproduce power differentials in society. Power chronography draws attention to time as a form of power structured in specific political and economic contexts, a site of material struggle and social difference. It explains variegated and intersecting social temporalities and their power effects on differently situated subjects. A complex composition of laws, built environments, services, and technologies, what Sharma calls temporal architectures, structure the time of irregular migrants and asylum seekers. In the chapter uh, that I'm presenting to you here, I'm particularly interested in how migrants recalibrate, um, to put it with Sharma, that is how they synchronize their body clocks, their sense of future or the present, to the tempo, duration, and directionality of such temporal architectures. Recalibration is very much about the micropolitics of temporal coordination and social control between multiple temporalities. Expectations to recalibrate time permeate the social fabric differently for distinct populations. And uh, for um, irregular migrants or migrants in a precarious legal situation, the request to recalibrate by waiting is ubiquitous. Everywhere you go uh, when you're in the field, uh, there are posters saying, please wait, uh, and people are told to patiente s'il vous plaît. Um, but such waiting uh, and this uh, uh, um, request to recalibrate by waiting at the same time is configured in a broader regime of uh, what I call accelerated migration control. 
Uh, reducing the waiting time of irregular migrants and asylum seekers has been a target of recent migra migration policies in France. The temporality of migration control is characterized by efforts to speed up and by a multiplication of temporal borders. As in other European countries, acceleration is hailed to enhance migration control and make the asylum system more efficient. Uh, and this has already been uh, studied uh, for the UK case, for instance, in an article from 2004, Sivana argued that the time politics of asylum in the UK from the 1990s on was characterized by an attempt to reorder and resynchronize the movements and fates of a fast increasing number of asylum seekers by speeding up the asylum process through new legislation and administrative procedures. A time politics of speed and acceleration also characterizes contemporary French approaches to migration control. The asylum law reform of 2015 and the revised law on migration and asylum of 2018 um, reiterated the aim to accelerate procedures towards regularization on the one hand and towards deportation on the other hand. One way in which the time politics of speed is translated into practice is through a redistributing of time taken and given by the state in the asylum process. With the revised laws, the deadlines to apply for regularization and appeal decisions were significantly shortened. While the temporal, temporal frames of the detention and deportation regime were significantly extended an extension legitimized by the need for a more speedy process of deportation. The ambition to speed up restructured the temporal architecture of the asylum system with consequences for the tempo, duration and directionality of migrants waiting. So what I'm interested in here is to examine the specific ways in which waiting is produced, distributed and experienced within such accelerated temporalities of migration control. So a first thing to note is that the pressure for acceleration rarely matches the everyday of migration control. Acceleration as a technology of governing migration therefore tends to produce gaps and assign people to waiting in ever more precarious situations. For instance, the reform of the asylum law in 2015 established a new system for registering asylum applications in France, which was intended to accelerate the process and reduce waiting times. From then on, all asylum seekers were required to pre-register with first reception platforms, who then distribute appointments to the so-called single desk at the prefecture where asylum claims are registered. This means that rather than waiting as asylum seekers, migrants wait with a future appointment at the prefecture to register their claim as their only protection from deportation. While an appointment to register a demand for asylum should in theory be given within three working days or 10 in periods of exceptional influx, according to the law, figures collected by an NGO called Marseille Asylum Observatory showed the average waiting time in 2017 and 2018 to be 40 days after registration with the first reception platform. Interestingly, the observatory makes a point of counting not only working days, but the full number of calendar days, pointing thus to a split between the duration of waiting time from the perspective of those who make people wait and those who are made to wait. Asylum seekers do not take time off from waiting during weekends and holidays in the same way employees who process their applications do. The fixing of appointments to the single desk is automated and computerized, the effect of which is both to put the waiting time of asylum seekers beyond the control of employees at the first reception platform and to produce a certain randomness in waiting periods. Um, the observatory registered uh, such randomness in waiting periods in their report, noting that individual appointments were given in 52 days, 28 days, 51 days, 25 days, and then suddenly two days, then again 54 days, 34 days, and 23 days. The technologies that are part of the overall temporal architecture 
in this case contributes to migrants' experience of uncertainty as to how long exactly they will have to wait. While official statistics show a reduction of average waiting times for asylum seekers from 226 days in January 2015 to 114 days in 2017, these statistics do not count the days of waiting to register the asylum application. So the gap between the three-day limit set by the law and the temporalities of the infrastructure that regulate actual access produces an interstitial time space during which the protection from deportation is weak and access to welfare and healthcare extremely limited. Consequently, many migrants in Marseille wait in conditions of great precarity. The employees at the first reception platform are part of this temporal architecture, which makes irregular migrants and asylum seekers wait before the state. Despite being employed by NGOs, their function as a first reception platform, which mediates access to the prefecture and the French Office for Immigration and Integration, make them crucial to migrants' experience of waiting as a form of power. This does not mean, though, that only asylum seekers are made to recalibrate to the deceleration and acceleration of various parts of the asylum procedure. Observing uh, and doing participant observation also with the employees at the uh, first reception platform uh, made me aware of how employees struggle to keep up the pace necessary to process the line of people who queued up in front of the platform every day. Attending morning meetings was akin to being in the calm before the storm, as everyone knew that there would be no more breaks or slowdowns until lunch. Employees worked long days, under high pressure, worrying about many variables only partly within their control. So in sem September 2018, employees went on strike, supported by around 20 NGOs, and demanded a reinforcement of staff to, staff to absorb waiting lines and provide a more dignified reception of asylum seekers. The waiting time produced by the asylum system is often conceived as an empty and dilated time that needs to be filled. Employees at the NGO running the first reception center talked about how asylum seekers must find ways to manage the waiting time and how the manageability related to the material reception structures. Um, but common to this was a way of thinking about the waiting time of asylum seekers as, as empty and as need of being filled. Uh, in particular, given that they were also deprived of the right to work and thus excluded from one of the major temporal rhythms of, of contemporary society. Employees at the first reception platform were enrolled in, in managing and normalizing this waiting time, both by instructing asylum seekers to wait and to be patient, and by telling them that, that it is normal, that they must wait. <clears throat> now, the pressure for acceleration of procedures was met with considerable ambivalence by my interlocutors who worked in the reception structures. On the one hand, they saw prolonged waiting as creating a lot of anxiety and as associated with deterioration of physical and mental health. On the other hand, they feared that the consequences of acceleration would be a further precarization of migrants and entail an erosion of their rights. With the shortening of the time limit for registering an asylum application, applicants would have less time to gather information, learn about the system and prepare their dossier. Accelerating the asylum procedure would also, some worried, make asylum seekers less prepared to start a new life should they be granted asylum. In this perspective, waiting time was not only seen as empty time to be filled, but also as a time of preparation to learn to know the asylum system, to learn French, to get an education, and to get to know the society. While this understanding of the management of time privileges an understanding of integration as the prospective future of asylum seekers, the current French, French policies of acceleration are geared primarily towards more effectively excluding those who are deemed by the state to be irregular. 
Now, the question of using the time spent in waiting is even more complex, however, if we see the waiting time as intersecting with temporalities related, for instance, to reproduction, health in, and labor. Uh, and here we can also uh, start to think about the, uh, what uh, Barbara and Lam has called uh, the discrepant temporalities of migration, the ruptures between how migration is imagined um, both individually and collectively uh, by migrants and how it is imagined uh, by, um, um, by the uh, authorities um, uh, and states and, and, and institutions. Uh, so in my chapter, I show how the usurpation of migrants' time by the asylum system and bureaucratic procedures um, may uh, further precarize them, for instance, within the labor market. Their time is coded as empty waiting time in need of being filled rather than as potentially productive time geared at the realization of migrants' own present and future projects. Uh, Bob's case is illustrative for this. Uh, for several years, Bob had been suffering, uh, suffering from severe stomach pain which ate him from inside, as he put it, and prevented him from working. Seeking health care upon arriving in Marseille, Bob was advised to register as an asylum seeker before the hospital could administer further medical examination. Recounting his conversation with the doctor, Bob explained, I said, but my problem is not primarily that of needing protection as an asylum seeker. My problem, it is my health. At least that is what I want first. But they told me, no, you must go and demand asylum first. So now I will go and ask for asylum, but I'm tired and I want to go to the hospital first. For Bob, finding out what was eating him was a primary concern, not least because of the pain and fatigue he was experiencing. Despite the experienced acuteness of his health condition, of being prevented from normal social interaction, of getting thinner, and less muscular every day and not being strong enough to work, Bob had to recalibrate to the temporalities of French migration management. Bob's immediate concern to get medical treatment was not only related to his individual health, but also to how his migration was collectively imagined and its temporality relationally constituted. In Mali, Bob's wife and children were waiting for his remittances to arrive so they would be able to pay for subsistence, schooling, and the house they were building. Haunted by the urgency of supporting his family back home, Bob waited every day at the roadside outside the primary site of informal labor in Marseille to, picked up, to be picked up for a day or more of work. It was vital to post in the early morning when entrepreneurs and private persons drove by to engage workers and the risk of being detained increased when the police started patrolling, usually by the late morning. The rhythm of informal work, however, was forcefully interrupted when Bob, prompted by his medical condition, recalibrated to the asylum procedure. As we were waiting at the first reception platform, an employer Bob worked for rang to offer him a job in construction work for the next few weeks. Hanging up, Bob explained to me that between queuing at the first reception platform, the appointment at the prefecture, the waiting line at the emergency clinic, and the regulations of entry at the emergency housing unit where he slept, he would not be left with any time to actually do the job. So rather than just filling up with delayed and empty time of waiting, the temporal architecture of the asylum procedure governed Bob's time in a very particular way. This may be analyzed in light of Ruben Anderson's suggestion that irregular migrants are not simply put on hold or slowed down. Rather, their time is devalued and usurped in endless bureaucratic procedures. Or, as Le Courant puts it, the undocumented are not only those who do not have the right to be present, they're also those who are dispossessed of the mastery of time. While this situation of recalibration is certainly an expression of the devaluation of the time of undocumented migrants and can be read as a form of dispossession, one should note that recalibration to economic and political dominant temporal structures is far from unique to those with a precarious legal status. 
Rather, we could see it with Shama as an uneven investment in time along a range of social differences, such as race, class, gender, labor, and immigration status. Now, the latter question of immigration status is important, given that the time politics of accelerated migration control is importantly geared towards timely deportation, fast deportation of those migrants deemed irregular. So before I end this presentation, let me say something about the temporal architectures underpinning the expanding detention and deportation regime and how waiting is produced, distributed and experienced by those who are awaiting deportation. Coinciding with efforts to accelerate the treatment of asylum applications and to speed up the return of those who fail, the creation of differentiated tracts has given rise to a proliferation of material structures that organize the waiting of asylum seekers and configure the tempos, duration and directionality of waiting in particular ways. The dismantlement of the informal camps in Calais and Grand Sainte, as well as certain parts of Paris in 2017, led the French government to create new forms of accommodation and orientation centers destined at those um, who are uh, categorized as Dublin uh, or on a fast track uh, towards uh, deportation. And of course, we know that within asylum uh, politics, uh, being in the fast lane is not a privilege as we usually associate it and for instance with uh, uh, international travel. The temporal rhythm in these kind of centers is characterized by the requirement to report regularly to the police station, lest one will be considered uh, absconding these centers are characterized by the absence of investments into the lives of their inhabitants. So there is not the future prospect of integration, which would uh, require some form of language training or other forms of training. The absence of temporal investment leaves inhabitants out of sync, uh, one can say, with the temporal orders of French society, recalibrated instead to the temporal architecture of the asylum system and the Dublin Agreement, and punctuated by the duty to report to the police. So unlike Bob, who was waiting to register his asylum claim, Bashir, a young man from Sudan, was waiting to be sent back to Italy. Bashir experienced waiting time as dilated, empty, and repetitive. He told me, there are no projects. There is no program for the day. You wake up, you eat, you sleep, you eat, you discuss with your friends, and you pass time. You pass the evening and the day passes like that. It's always the same routine. But little by little, you become disgusted by life because you stay there and you do nothing. We are bored, we are broken. To Bashir, waiting time is empty, a repetitive eternal present, characterized by boredom and passivity. The feeling of temporal dilation and spatial retraction was accentuated by the isolated location of the center. Waiting as a Dubliner or in other fast tracks was further characterized by sudden ruptures in, in ruptures in the form of events of expulsion, a constant source of strong uncertainty and nervousness to most. So Bashir told me that you wait for the day of your expulsion. How much time before your expulsion? It could be tomorrow. Tomorrow they could send you to Italy. Of the people I arrived with, two were already scheduled and they expulsed them to Italy three others who, given they did not want to go, ran away. So now they are wanted by the border police. In the middle of the winter, they ran away. Whether they find somewhere to sleep is up to them. In this grim light, Bashir was incessantly contemplating his own options, to stay in the center and wait for a sudden expulsion to arrive or to escape and try to stay off the grid until his status as a Dubliner uh, which was how he referred to himself, uh, was finally broken, as he put it. Managing to live undetected by the authorities for 18 months would give him the possibility, under the uh, current Dublin regulation, uh, to file a new asylum application in France. Now, the question of, of timing or staying and moving at the right time was thus crucial to the consideration of those anxiously awaiting deportation. While escaping and hiding can be seen as a way to circumvent state management of waiting time, efforts to circumvent waiting can also be um, imply political mobilization. 
So Bashir in this case did not only recalibrate to the tempo imposed by the administrative procedures of the asylum system. Despite his experience of temporal dilation, emptiness and boredom, he managed to transform um, the waiting time into building up a social network mobilizing together with local activists to protest the conditions of living at the center. At a series of public meetings, he denounced the politics of abandonment represented by these structures and called for migrants to hold French authorities accountable to their professed ideals of un universal human rights. In an appeal co-written by migrants and local activists, they demanded the annulment of the Dublin procedure, a stop in deportation, the acceptance of their right to demand asylum in France, in France, the demolition of the center and access to education and vocational training. Solidarity and political mobilization are difficult to build in haste though. In the midst of his efforts to change not only his own, but also other migrants waiting situation, the accelerated temporality of migration control suddenly caught up with Bashir. He was arrested during one of his weekly reports to the police station. The next morning, before his friends and activist network had time to mobilize, he was put on a flight to Italy, where yet another cycle of waiting for an uncertain future was about to begin. So to conclude very briefly before we move on um, to the discussion, um, I have attempted in this lecture, um, although very sketchily, to give some examples of how we can explore waiting as a particular engagement in and with time. And this has required attention to different dimensions of temporality, uh, different dimensions of time, including tempo, duration and directionality, and also to how temporality is multiple and relationally constituted. Paying attention to how the waiting of migrants is legally and socially produced and configured in the current French context, I have examined speed or acceleration as part of the mechanism of migration and border regimes. The notion of power chronographies uh, I have found helpful because it avoids taking acceleration as a given of contemporary societies or positing a simple opposition between fast and slow classes or those waiting and those who, are, uh, uh, who make others wait. Instead, it points to variegated and intersecting social temporalities uh, and their power effects on differently situated uh, subjects. Given the extensive critique of protected waiting situation voiced by migrants and migrant right activists, one would perhaps expect speeding up to bring migrants in sync with the speed of contemporary society reducing the stress associated with protracted waiting. Um, but in, this, in my chapter, I try to nuance this understanding of acceleration and deceleration. Um, so I argue that efforts to speed up the treatment of asylum applications, as well as the deportation of those cast as irregular, have restructured the temporal architecture of French migration control. The politics of speed produces gaps in time spaces of waiting during which protection from deportation is weak and access to welfare and healthcare extremely limited. Investigating waiting as constituted within multiple and relational temporalities, I've tried to show how migrants with a precarious legal status recalibrate to a composition of laws, built environments, services and technologies, synchronizing their bodies and life projects to the tempo, duration and directionality of complex temporal architectures. By doing this, I hope to have exemplified some of the ways in which waiting can serve as a prism for critical analysis in migration studies and beyond, but also to have warned against taking the normative underpinnings of waiting for, granting in the, for granted in the analysis. I hope the perspectives that we have developed can resonate also beyond the field of migration studies and Indeed, the, the analytics of waiting and temporality uh, seems to have particular purchase in the current situation as ever more people experience their lives as put on hold and the future seems increasingly uncertain for many as a consequence of the pandemic. 
Um, so if you're interested in, in uh, seeing how we can also um, work with waiting as an analytical prism to think about the current uh, pandemic situation, I encourage you to have a look at uh, our project website and some of the interve interventions um, where we have mobilized the analytical perspectives developed in WAIT to think about how the pandemic on the one hand has been generalizing some of the temporal frowns, frames that we found salient in the lives of irregular migrants, but how it has simultaneously, as we all know, illuminated the many, uh, the many lines of, of differentiation. Uh, including not, not least the socioeconomic materialities which condition people's waiting uh, for uncertain futures. So I'll leave it there and yeah, thank you. Christine, thank you so much for this wonderful um, presentation and um, for taking us into a very interesting ethnographic uh, context. Uh, around the politics and subjective experiences of, of waiting in the French asylum system. I'm sure there are lots of questions. One of the things I wanted to say is that it's quite uh, nice to see that some of the people who are going to be, actually some of the colleagues and scholars who are going to be also giving papers uh, in this seminar were actually attending the talk. One was Safet uh, um, Haji Musa, Mohamedovic, who just left us, and he's going to give actually his own talk on waithood, which is also his work uh, in a couple of weeks' time, and um, and others also here. So it's nice to 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 see that we can build a transnational community of of uh, scholars, uh, thanks to the online um, potentiality, I would say. Um, so I have lots of questions, but uh, I would uh, like to first invite our patient uh, audience to, um, to see if they have already formulated some questions that they would like to pose. Um, and I would invite anyone who wants to uh, intervene to just um, raise their hands and uh, take the floor. Okay, so while uh, people are gathering their thoughts, uh, obviously these are complex issues and I'm, I'm sure that we, with the way you ended the discussion obviously brought us uh, back to the, the, the here and now of the pandemic. Um, I was very intrigued by your, um, what I perceived as a sort of this juncture between the introduction of your talk and, and ethnography, uh, whereby in the introduction you took us into um, an idea of how the exploration of time can lead us to um, or can be agreed into rereading or contesting what others have called methodolo methodological nationalism. So um, in your introduction, you were mentioning how, for example, this work in particular, your, your research in the past five years with, with uh, the colleagues that participated in it as well, allowed you to produce a contestation of the heteronormative capitalist nationalist racialized regimes of of time uh, but then actually during the talk and obviously you you did you did tell us you did warn us that you were going to obviously focus on one particular instance which is what you call the redemptive end of waiting um, of the asylum of in the asylum system uh, in marseille but in you know throughout the actual ethnographic part of the talk you you this um, promise of the engagement with time um, went a bit lost and um, we we see a rather like a clear example of of um, of the way in which the control of people's times contribute to their disposability um, and assumes their disposability to start with the idea that migrants anyway, have no, nothing to do, have no time, have no connections, have no families waiting for their remittances that you showed, have no plans for life and so on. So it assumes and reproduces um, that kind of disposability. So I wanted to kind of invite you to reflect a bit further on this, um, how, if, if there were examples in your ethnography that is obviously really extended and, and multipolar of uh, these contestations that you talked about at the beginning. Um, and my second question, while um, people also gather their thoughts, um, 
is in relation to your um, discussion around intersectionality. And towards the end, you said something really important, something really interesting. In my view, that is that uh, we should adopt inter intersectional lens to understand the work of time or control of time and therefore of waiting because um, the um, regimes of waiting that are imposed on asylum seekers are not exclusive to them. I mean, they are imported and reproduced from other contexts. So I, want, I also was very intrigued by these and I wanted to, to see whether ethnographically there were examples that, or there are examples that you can bring uh, to us in relation to how these um, regimes of weighthood are enacted from and reproduced across gendered, settler colonial and liber liberal regimes, for example. So these are my two questions for now. Um, and if there are no questions from the audience, I, as, as of yet, I would um, welcome your thoughts on these two to start with. Um, thank you, Ruba, for these uh, great and, and quite um, ex large uh, questions. Um, you're quite right that um, in the introduction I made a um, general point uh, about how we had been um, uh, how it had become important to us to avoid um, assuming uh, this particular narrative of a uh, linear kind of waiting time um, from exclusion to inclusion in the nation state, sort of with, with where uh, the future and uh, the, the temporal movement is thought as one and as uh, having a particular kind of, of directionality and redemptive endpoint. And I think we can agree that that it, it, there is a risk about that, that but we as, as researcher and um, uh, many activists, etc., cetera, uh, risks running into because we focus on, on the kind of legal political exclusion um, from the state, which is sort of what defines the um, condition of, of illegality or, or um, irregularization of migrants. So that was meant as a more sort of uh, general warning. Uh, and I don't think that I assume uh, in my own in my own ethnography that those are the endpoints or um, uh, the only futures in view uh, for the migrants that I talk about. Uh, but I don't spend much time on unpacking those alternative futures or, or opening towards those. And, and you're right about that. Um, sort of my account focuses primarily on uh, power chronographies and, and acceleration as, as a form of, of, of um, yeah, uh, power and, and, and aspect of migration control. But I try to point out um, by talking about those other relationships to other geographical spaces, uh, to families um, in, in other locations, to the futures represented there um, by relationships to other people, etc. Uh, and uh, other chapters in the book do that uh, much more than I do uh, in my own chapters. So that is part of, but it's, it's also something about um, being um, uh, uh, aware of uh, uh, thinking about what, what kind of, of futures we are talking about and what ca kind of presence we are talking about and not assuming that they're all one and that they're all contained within this uh, story uh, of, of, of this uh, framing within uh, the nation state. Uh, as for your other question about um, the intersectionality um, I completely agree with you. And one of the, the discussions we've had in the WAIT project is, of course, um, whether there's something particular about uh, the, the um, uh, about waiting in um, irregular migration or in the condition of illegality, uh, and to what extent uh, those are part of sort of broader. Uh, uh, productions of, of temporal inequality and in different kinds of, of uh, uh, both uh, uh, geographical and historical contexts. 
uh, as you mentioned uh, yourself, uh, for instance, uh, colonialism, uh, and as related also to, to um, gender, sexuality, race, and class. Uh, and I think it, um, we have um, been um, trying to make those uh, connections, uh, but without sort of creating this uh, homogeneous uh, picture of, uh, of, of uh, some parts of the world or some groups as uh, uh, wait, always in a situation of waiting, et cetera, so precisely mobilizing this idea of, of intersectionality to look at different historical and geographical uh, conjunctures of production of waiting. But I think there are many interesting parallels. Uh, and of course, we have uh, we draw upon literature uh, that uh, talks about waiting as more sort of uh, widespread uh, conditions in certain parts of the world and in certain socioeconomic uh, positionalities in our discussions and the ways in which we think about waiting in our own project. Right. Thank you very much, Christine. That was great. Um, so we have one question. Uh, I can't, unfortunately, I can't pronounce the name because it's written in... Uh, so if you can, whoever is, yeah, hi. Uh, so, hi. Sorry about that, I can't read that. I'm so sorry, I'm using someone else's computer. My name is Bea, uh, and that's written in Greek. Yeah, sorry for that. Oh, yeah, that's Greek, okay. Uh, yeah. So I have a question, actually, it's uh, a bit related to the uh, was last uh, part of the question. I was wondering um, what kind of uh, differences, maybe if you could talk about the different um, experiences of waiting between different migrants or different migrant groups with different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also working on um, well, migrant waiting and uh, hope I've been working in Greece, uh, mm -hmm. but I've been working with a specific group of um, political refugees from Turkey. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realized that their political subjectivities are really important to the way they understand the waiting and the way they survive mm -hmm. this extended transitionality and the way they interpret it and deal with it and uh, the way they find um, sources of hope in this mm -hmm. uh, seemingly hopeless situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was wondering yeah, if you uh, noticed some interesting ways in which people's subjectivities, religion, uh, background, age, uh, sexual identity, orientation, and so on, affected the, the way they experienced waiting. Mm. Uh, if you have maybe some examples that uh, would illuminate these differences. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think that it, it, that is, is very important, and perhaps particular when it comes to, to um, political subjectivities uh, and, and in relation to waiting and in relation to um, thoughts about um, past and, and futures that are opened up uh, in different uh, situations of waiting, what we have primarily been focusing as uh, is um, um, we have not worked so much uh, with the point of departure in different groups, but uh, through looking at the uh, encounter uh, with the um, legal uh, and, uh, and uh, bureaucratic authorities and the kind of, of, of uh, experiences of waiting that are produced there. So we would get a, a different uh, material and a different um, understanding of, of um, the subjectivities involved in waiting if we took, for instance, as a point of departure, as you may do, a Palestinian uh, diaspora somewhere, etc. Uh, so that has not been, been our uh, primary concern, but we have been looking into, of course, how, for instance, such things as um, hope or future imaginaries may be created, for instance, in, in dialogue with uh, various religious communities and how one thinks about prospering, how one thinks about uh, progressing, how one thinks about futurity, for instance, in relation to uh, different uh, religious imaginaries uh, and things like that. So that are part of, of the different case studies that we have uh, looking at that. Um, but it is also the case that, that our focus has been 
uh, much on sort of the, the social legal production of waiting and that sort of encounter and how that shapes uh, uh, subjectivities. Mm. Thank you. Um, so if you can introduce yourself also when asking questions, just because I think it's nice to, um, to know um, each other, given that we are so uh, remotely connected. So I think that was Beha from the University of Cambridge, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we have a question from, <laughs> we have a question from uh, David. Uh, do you want, David, do you want me to, to put the question on for you? Or do you want to unmute yourself? Okay, and if you want me to talk, yeah. Please, <laughs> you can introduce yourself briefly also. Yes, uh, my name is Oludaya David Akimboboe, um, and I'm a first year student at SOAS. Um, and I was um, privileged to actually, in my foundation year, I was privileged to write this mini, mini skew um, research report um, on the, um, the, the Wyomings. Um, I wrote the borders, uh, yeah, and then it was it was a small scale just to look at the impact of the hostile environment on regular migrants who, for some reason in their life, have had to claim asylum, and how the impact and and obviously there was um, yeah, a small scale interview and all of that. But my question is. Um, the terminology hostile environment that was phrased was coined by a uh, Labour, UK Labour Minister, Alan Johnson. And um, I noticed that asylum um, seeker treatment very vastly all across, I can even say across the world. And the asylum law is not particularly a local, well, from my own understanding from what I've read, it's not a local law, it's an international agreement. But the treatment of people very vastly and of course this hostile environment would you in your view would you say this is a kind of a hostile way of treating the the, 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 the asylum seekers i mean in your experience what, what would you say um i haven't worked myself with the concept of of the hostile environment so i'm not very familiar with with this um, concept, um, and um, um, but uh, there are um, it, it resonates with other things for me. So among other things, I've been thinking in relation to um, the concept of temporal architectures that I was mentioning. I've been thinking about the sort of the materialities and and the the infrastructures of temporal architecture uh, as hostile uh, and then invoking or thinking about um, uh, the for instance the very sort of concrete concrete hostile architectures um, that are uh, uh, um, uh, that the waiting space or the spaces where asylum seekers wait uh, are very often not configured to accommodate waiting or bodies in waiting. So that the, the kind of uh, hostile architecture, you even find uh, sort of, you know, of these peaks being put out, uh, um, put up that are impossible to sit down, you know, uh, outside, for instance, uh, 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 public uh, offices, etc., where um, asylum seekers wait. So there is that level of very sort of concrete material uh, kind of hostile architectures that are not, um, um, and that is a, a great contrast to uh, if you see how sort of waiting is is configured in ways that cause as, as less as as little trouble and pain for bodies as possible. For instance, sort of in in, in uh, airports where you try to facilitate waiting, or, or, or especially in fast tracks and lounges, etc. So this, so there, there are interesting things uh, to think about there, definitely. But for the the sort of notion of the hostile environment, I haven't worked with in that particular way. Thank you, Christine. Um, so we have um, a question from Malouz, a colleague in the Department of Anthropology. Malouz. Yes, 
Sorry, I uh, muted myself. Thank you very much for this interesting uh, talk and sorry for joining late. Uh, but I was, I keep on saying I was running from meeting to meeting. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm moving from one room to another actually, but still there was another meeting. So apologies if what I'm saying is not really relevant. But I'm struggling with this notion of waiting. So mm -hmm. I work in, um, um, in also in, um, well, in West Africa and I work on youth studies. And in youth studies, this notion of wait, which is quite important mm -hmm. because youth is studied as a kind of, um, well, a period in life as weighthood. Mm. Um, young people don't have the financial means to marry and don't have the financial means then to reach adulthood. So they are living in weighthood. Mm. So on the one hand, I think it's a very powerful concept and mm. Alcinda Honvana has written a lot about it, an mm. anthropologist. But I also find it a problematic term because it reduces people to just waiting and it somehow assumes that people are just sitting and waiting. Mm -hmm. So I'm struggling with this kind of notion. So I started using the notion of navigation. So I'm navigating through my life or through certain life trajectories. So I want to hear from you what you think about the advantages, but also the disadvantages of this notion of wait waiting mm -hmm. and waithood. Thank you. Uh, very much. Yeah, the literature on, on weighthood is something that we have, gauge, uh, have engaged quite a lot with. And, and uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's um, one of the engagements that has led us also to question some of the uh, normative underpinnings of thinking about waiting, because precisely this idea of sort of being stuck and not being able to move into adulthood or, or to progress in life in a certain sense is also uh, um, very often underpinned by certain understandings of, of uh, normative understandings of the life cycle and of the expected sort of ways in which one can move forward in one's life and in, in society. So we've been very sort of trying to unpack those sort of normative underpinnings and, and we're of, of reproducing them. And the other thing that you're pointing to is of course also the, the ways in which um, ideas about waiting often sort of um, uh, bring in ideas about pass passivity and about lack of agency, et cetera, et cetera. So we have also uh, tried uh, uh, not to take that for granted, not to have this uh, opposition. And there have been many attempts in theorizing waiting to think about um, waiting as a passive activity or, uh, you know, as agential in different forms of, of ways. So we have been thinking rather than sort of opposing um, um, passivity activity, we try to look at the ways in which um, the, the kinds of, of ways of acting uh, that are sort of also part of, of what we call uh, waiting, and that can be anything from uh, from uh, what Ghazan Haj talks about as waiting it out, sort of uh, to more active ways of, of mobilizing, creating collectivities of waiting and alternative uh, uh, futures uh, through sort of uh, creating uh, a collective situation of waiting, etc. When it comes to social navigation, I'm, I'm very fond of the concept of navigation, in particular the way in which Henrik Wieg uh, used to say um, uh, in his work uh, on social navigation, one of the chapters in the weight volume uh, uses social navigation, uh, uh, particularly to talk about sort of um, waiting as a more sort of uh, active, um, uh, waiting in a more active sense. And of course, the, 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 um, uh, the, the origins of the words of, of, uh, uh, waiting, at least in, in French, uh, we talk about uh, attendre, and that also means uh, paying attention to. So there is also, uh, very often in conceptualizations of waiting, there is also a dimension of anticipation. So that waiting is as, 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 a, as a form of, of anticipation or future making or active engagement in a sense. And so we're trying to unpack that as well and not sort of uh, as I said, only rely on, on ideas about waiting as, as something happening within this liminal time or, or within a, a stasis, uh, etc. So, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you, Christine and uh, Malouz for the question. Um, we have um, a question from Katarzyna. Hi, yeah. 
Uh, so my name is uh, Katya. It's easier. I don't know why my computer says Katarzyna. My name is Katja Schwider. I'm an assistant professor at the Free University of Amsterdam. And uh, I'm a lawyer by training and I work on the issues of statelessness and nationality. Um, uh, I had a question uh, about uh, the conceptual framework of the book. I find it uh, a fascinating book, definitely planning to read it uh, after your presentation. So thank you very much for that. Um, when working on statelessness in the legal sphere, I came across uh, this issue of uh, a limbo language, uh, the language of putting off of, of, of the space of inactive uh, beings, uh, and especially in the context of statelessness, even the word itself uh, speaks of the absence of, 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 of connection to the state. So it is very much this passive empty category where it is very difficult to study in a way what happens in the state of statelessness. The only thing you can really easily study is how to get out of it and how to not get into it uh, mm -hmm. to begin with. But the, the statelessness itself as a legal phenomenon is almost empty and very much deprived of the agency of people who undergo it. So that is a connection I very strongly saw with, uh, with what you described. And what I found difficult in trying to um, discuss the agency of stateless persons and what happens to them legally uh, while they are stateless, because a lot of legal um, things happen to them while they're stateless. In fact, a lot more than people who are nationals often because they get detained, they come in front of a judge. There is really a lot happening. Um, but by using this language of agency, where I would speak about people's aspirations or what people do, um, it almost felt like I was undermining the cause of showing how difficult that situation is. So um, uh, the, 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 the use of, of this passive language of, in a way, the misery or the absence or lack of something is, is used uh, to uh, uh, yeah, for emancipatory purposes to show that those people's lives is so very difficult. So in a way, for me, when I was talking about the things actually happening, lives continuing, mm -hmm. uh, developments taking place, it was almost felt like undermining that uh, political argument of it being a very uh, desperate, uh, uh, yeah, situation. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether you came across that, and if so, how you dealt with it. How uh, can you tell the story of active agency that you actually observe? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, without uh, undermining the story of, um, yeah, of, 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 uh, of, of difficulty that is subsequently mm. used for emancipatory reasons. And another question I had about uh, the normalizing of waiting that happens mm. and whether, uh, whether you saw the, uh, the, um, uh, the concept of culpability uh, as playing a role in the normalizing of waiting so the fact that people did move or actually used in a way their agency uh, to, to move or to arrive or to stay, uh, whether uh, this idea of fault and culpability plays a role in uh, normalizing uh, this waiting as a phenomenon. And that's again something I, I came across in my research on statelessness, that wherever agency is spoken of, it is often in a negative sense. So the agency very quick, quickly becomes fault and culpability. And uh, yeah, so uh, whether you have any thoughts uh, or reflections on that, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, um, for this uh, very important question. Um, I think you point also to more sort of uh, general challenges with doing uh, research in this kind of field and a, fully, a field with, with, uh, where uh, the um, sort of uh, the political struggles and the real consequences of policies are always part of the picture that we, we research and we have to relate very actively as researchers uh, to how sort of the knowledge that we produce and, and present, how that uh, is also read against a certain political reality. Uh, so definitely, and, and I think there have been people pointing to this dilemma that uh, the 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 um, there is a risk uh, to both sort of uh, overemphasizing uh, passivity and victimhood and and sort of reducing uh, migrants to subjects without uh, capacity for for um, for agency, but also on the other hand, it's problematic in a sense. Uh, when we try to think about the uh, kinds of, of tactics and strategies and, and other 
uh, uh, modes uh, and, and strengths that, that migrants also mobilize and how to present that in a, in a very sort of uh, uh, um, politicized field. So I don't have any good solutions for that. It's something that I think we all struggle with, how to deal with that, how to balance that. I think there are traditions in anthropology for, for sort of trying to balance that. But of course, what's particular in our case is that many of the tactics that, that are then used and that we are just dis, um, dis, uh, observing in the field would sort of be by states be categorized as illegal, right? Um, so for instance, acquiring uh, papers through alternative channels or working informally, as I was describing, uh, um, running away for to avoid uh, deportation and stuff like that. So it's very it's it's very difficult how we should deal with these sort of accounts of, of people's tactics that are mobilized. And I have don't have a a good solution uh, uh, to offer you, but maybe that is something that that we can uh, discuss. As for the question of, of fault and culpability um, in relation to statelessness, I haven't thought that much of it or not at least in relation to uh, statelessness, but I think that there are ways in which sort of uh, uh, there is a lot of normativity around sort of the uh, good ways of moving uh, and bad ways of moving and uh, that there are certain uh, motivations for moving that are more accepted and, and acceptable uh, in, in uh, public discourse uh, than others. Uh, and there are also ways of, of sort of blaming and shaming uh, particular ways of moving and, and uh, yeah, uh, and that, um, you see it very, uh, I, I used to work with uh, the topic of, of uh, migration for sex work. And you see it very clearly in the discussions around the topic of trafficking, uh, where you get this, uh, uh, very often get this sort of polarized distinction between victims of trafficking, uh, who are sort of pictured as, as innocent victims, et cetera. Uh, and then human smuggling, which is sort of a, a quite different description of, of people, uh, you know, uh, paying and, and maneuvering, et cetera. And, and especially for, for uh, women engaged in sex work to, to claim or to um, account your story uh, through sort of an, an uh, agential self, in a sense, is very problematic because you risk falling out very quickly at this category of, of, of the of the clean victim in a sense. So those are real uh, struggles, uh, not only how to represent this for us as researchers, but also for people who are accounting their stories uh, within these systems of, of, of asylum, et cetera, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Katya, and for your question and Christine. Um, I also want to mention that we have actually Annelies Moores here in the audience who's also gonna give a talk in the next, uh, in three weeks time. So it's really nice to have her um, now as, as, as audience. <laughs> um, and uh, one of your co-authors, uh, um, Shahram Kozravi is also giving a talk in this series in the next term. So uh, um, we're very glad about that. So we have a couple of really interesting questions. Uh, one has been put in the chat. I don't know whether uh, Nora wants to ask a question or whether she wants me to uh, to ask. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, I can I can ask it. Um, I just want to pick up on some flags. Can you hear me? You look like an astronaut. Are you wrapped in flags? <laughs> I no. <laughs> have a bit of a cold, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, hi, I'm from SOAS. Um, and um, I, I just wanted to pick up on something you said in response to the question on hostile environments. Um, you mentioned the spaces that migrants are waiting in, and I was wondering um, that they are so hostile. I was wondering there stands stark discrepancy to this kind of like environment that, that makes um, migrants wait um, and all those procedures that are in place. Has anybody from like the bureaucratic side or from like, I don't know, the people who work with migrants um, on, on processing um, ever commented on that or said anything about that, like why those spaces are the way they are or any observations around that? Hmm. 
Um, it would be interesting, of course, to, I don't know, to interview uh, people on, on that uh, respect. I have talked to, um, for instance, uh, the, the, the people at the first reception platform I talked about, uh, they, the employees there tended to be, to, to be rather um, upset themselves and that's why they went on strike over the, the sort of uh, the, the uh, conditions of, of waiting for the migrants and they did, um, they had different systems uh, trying to sort of um, have a list that you could describe your name on on the door but sort of very low technology so you wouldn't have to stand all the time because people would have to show up at five o'clock in the morning um, to to get in front of the line uh, and then um, if you have this list on the door at least you could put your name up and be sure that you were among the 10 first and stuff like that so there were sort of some some little efforts to to make um the waiting situation less brutal in a sense, but but it would be interesting, of course. And there has been also campaigns, for instance, in Marseille, where I did my field work, uh, directed towards the authorities, saying that these waiting conditions has to be done something with um, to register your asylum claim in uh, in Marseille, at least for periods to go to the prefecture. People would have to come uh, the evening before and actually sleep uh, or be in the line uh, the whole night. Um, to be among those a few uh, people that would actually be able to 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 pose a, a claim uh, for asylum in a day, uh, and there were all sorts of arrangements there of, of uh, having people uh, keep a spot for you and people selling their spots and and stuff like that. But it would be I think it would be really really interesting to do a study of that uh, of of it in itself you know of those kind of the the materialities and and how they are thought from from sort of and within this uh, regime of migration control, yeah. Yeah, I think this is really an important question. I'm myself really interested in um, what I call, I mean, as you know, Christine, the aesthetic of weighthood. And uh, I think the aesthetic also to do with the infrastructure of weighthood mm -hmm. or the affective material kind of side mm -hmm. of things. I mean, I, I can think of airports in the Middle East, but elsewhere as well, where, <laughs> You know, the first thing you encounter in landing in Beirut is um, migrants from Asia waiting in, th like dozens of them waiting with only three chairs available for these long, interminable mm -hmm. processing times. Mm -hmm. And but of course, it, it, it was really interesting, just to add something, it was really interesting for me to see uh, precisely what I talked about this this kinds of how we're differently uh, positioned in relation to social differentiation in relation to waiting because my presence often affected the waiting situation of those I were accompanying or I was treated differently from others so I could come to a place uh, where there were uh, uh, you know, uh, 30 um, African men standing in a line, and someone would come. Uh, someone would come running with a chair for me, uh, because I was this white professor researcher coming. Uh, you know, differently. So it's very, also very <laughs> sort of hand, hands on uh, that you see sort of how we're differently positioned within these the uh, um, materialities of waiting. Sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, no, exactly. I mean, that's exactly my point. As opposed to context in which waiting is actively uh, claimed, uh, like in, for example, Palestinian refugees I worked with, where waiting uh, for a return is, mm -hmm. even though their life is much more along the lines that Marluz has uh, mentioned before, negotiating, aspiring, dreaming, acting upon... Uh, seeking migration, seeking rights and resources, etc. So there, it's nothing really to do about, mm. it's nothing to do with a passive or static um, kind of predicament, but uh, weighthood as a political, conceptual um, mm. and uh, aspirational mm. status is, is actively claimed. So I think mm. that there are lots of really interesting nuances. But yeah, I think that the issue of infrastructures of waiting um, and how that, that sort of the, the environments are made hostile, even from an infrastructural point of view, which is something mm -hmm. you also mentioned in your talk in relation to the discrepancy between the acceleration of, of the asylum 
process and the pro- prolonged times of uh, the application itself. Mm. So how does that translate into an infrastructural lens? I think is really important how, how people are made uh, to wait where, in which, you know, in which um, structures and so on. I mean, can be taken in, in so many directions. So thank you, Nora, for really bringing us to the uh, infrastructure architecture kind of side of things. <laughs> Nora is our PhD student in the department and she's an architect by training. Oh, great, great. Um, um, so if you're not uh, tired, Christine, we have um, one um, question also. Um, actually, we have a couple of questions. Um, one, which I will use for the end, because <laughs> it, uh, it deviates a little bit from the topic. One from Annelies uh, Moores, uh, who um, I, I'll read out the questions from the chat. Annelies, who is professor of anthropology, actually emeritus professor at the University of Amsterdam. Um, Thank you. Apologies for not being able to open my video or sound. This was a very interesting talk. I was wondering about what you think about the relation between waiting as a sense of being stuck, yet also turning this then in a more active waiting it out, obviously referring to Hassan Haj. Mm. Yes, what do I think about that? Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, I somehow, oh, there it is. I somehow lost. Well, um, I think, yeah, I think uh, Hassan Hajj's um, thinking about uh, stuckedness and waiting out is very interesting uh, perspectives and, and intakes, and it is used uh, in a couple of uh, uh, of the chapters in the book, uh, quite actively, uh, one chapter by by Myra, Marianne Carlson, uh, for instance, which looks at the concept of uh, endurance uh, and sort of uh, situations um, where it's not either. Um, um, it's not either um, stockedness or an active waiting out, but, but where endurance has uh, facets of, of uh, different modalities uh, of waiting. So I think that chapter is one thing that uh, you could look at. I'm not going to try to um, um, sum up her argument here, but, but it is very interesting. Um, um, Annelise, I would like to hear more from you on this. Are you are you not able to turn your microphone on? What were you thinking in particular? Annelise, can you turn your microphone on or are you hiding beyond the technology? <laughs> it seems that her microphone, I mean, she can hear but cannot engage. Yeah. It's- but we'll hear from Annelies uh, very soon uh, because her talk is on the 25th of November yeah. on veils, face masks, mm-hmm. and selective liberal anxieties on another topic. But uh, I'm sure that uh, Christine, if you come on to that, she can answer your <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah, she, she can tell me more about why she's wondering about this. But I, think, I mean, it's interesting in relation to to um, different ways in which people relate to to future, right, and how the future. Uh, is involved in in waiting, right? And and it might be very different kinds of, of engagements here. Um, yes, I can hear it. Thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah, I find possible possible simultaneously of both interesting. Yes, we can. Let's uh, leave it there. But thank you, Annelies. I yeah. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I'm receiving questions as always from all kinds of directions on different uh, devices. I um, no, I just wanted to add something because what I, I said just earlier on didn't make much sense. What I meant with, was because I'm looking at the refugee camps infrastructure as a, as a site of claiming hatred. And mm. when one asks the question, why, why after 70 years do we still need camps? Mm. Uh, why can't we just, just dismantle them? And, and the answer is that they represent sort of, from, from, they offer an example of how one can claim hatred uh, politically. Um, mm 
through the maintaining of, a, of an infrastructure of, of weighthood, if you wish, mm -hmm. like refugee counties. Anyway, sorry, this is a, <laughs> taking uh, the discussion um, away from the point of um, waiting it out. I think um, we have one last question, Christine, if you can um, bear with us. Uh, we are all very interested in this topic. So, uh, and this takes us to the current um, <clears throat> predicament we are all living in globally, which is the pandemic. Yes. So the question is, uh, what impact has the current pandemic, uh, which is so characterized by a form of stuckedness, uh, what impact has uh, the pandemic on this notion of wait, waithood or waiting? Uh, do, you, do you have any reflections to offer <laughs> on how the literature or the scholarship on waiting can inform the contemporary global predicament, which in fact has moved beyond, very much beyond the waiting times of migrants and refugees and asylum seekers. And have, I mean, waithood has become, not only in Hassan Haj's, Haj's term, waiting, waiting out the crisis, but waiting out the, the global pandemic. You know? Mm. So, is there any reflection that you might want to mm. offer on how this literature helps us to understand the current global mm. waiting? Um, so, one of the ways in which we started to think about this um, when we were all uh, um, under lockdown in March was that uh, many of the concepts that we had been working with in the WAIT project seem precisely to get a sort of a, a new relevance uh, in a sense. And of course, um, one of the things is, is um, relates to um, the um, to uncertainty and to future perspectives. Uh, and um, we noticed how people who were sort of used to having a temporal horizon of planning uh, all of a sudden had to reckon with this radical uncertainty uh, that is uh, dominant in the, already in the lives of very many people, but that uh, um, uh, those who are temporally privileged in a sense may have been more shielded from, in a sense, of, the, of this radical uncertainty of the future. Uh, uh, and that that seemed to generalize in a sense. And, and that was manifested, of course, in very banal things is, are we going to postpone or cancel or what are we doing with all those future plans um, that we have? So we thought that was interesting um, also uh, to look at that and to look at, at the notions of, of uh, stockedness and waiting out also the relationship between more situational forms of waiting and more existential forms of waiting, how we could sort of uh, mobilize those kinds of understanding and, and understanding people's experiences during the pandemic. But I think also more importantly, um, as, I, as I already mentioned, the, it also the pandemic really, really brings out uh, the differentiation in uh, how position uh, how people are positioned in different spatial and temporal hierarchies. So as we know, and this has been mentioned, you know that uh, just the idea of sort of waiting out the pandemic and the crisis and of sort of hiding in one's private home and shielding and and observing these barriers, et cetera, is, is already a very sort of a privileged uh, relation to, to space and time that is only available for some people. So that I think it also really brings out sort of these uh, uh, aspects of, of differentiation and positionality, which is important in in understanding uh, waiting. And then some people were discussing whether this sort of generalization of, of the experience of radical uncertainty and, and having sort of lives put on hold, if that could uh, energize some sort of, of solidarity or even produce some, some new forms of, of political subjectivities and sharedness, sort of, sort of uh, shared temporal predicaments that, that could um, give rise to alternative political visions and alternative future visions. And there, so there has been quite a, a, a bit of also hopeful uh, imaginaries generated in relation to, to the pandemic of, of other 
uh, less un environmentally unfriendly futures of futures that would not exclude uh, certain um, inhabitants from the welfare and health arrangements of societies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, so that is out there as a sort of uh, uh, certain kinds of imaginaries. Um, and, and yet um, we are still uh, somehow in the middle of this. And so to say anything about the, I, I see that there are already a lot of conferences that set around on the post pandemic and what that will be. But of course, that's part of the, the radically uncertain future right now. Also, the, the dimension to us whether this sort of generalizing of uh, certain forms of, of waiting and radical uncertainty can generate um, uh, new sort of political imaginaries that are more uh, inclusive and, and less uh, unequal. Thank you, Christine. That was really, um, really, really interesting and inspiring. Uh, you got us really thinking into time at this very late time of the day <laughs> after people have been like Marlus running from one, running only virtually from one meeting to the other. But uh, I really wanted to thank you for um, a very fascinating paper and we look forward to, to read the book and to actually have it in our reading list. Um, so um, if there are no other questions, um, I think we should start wrapping up with um, maybe announcing next week's uh, talk. So next week we will have um, another really fascinating talk by Professor Anandi Ramamurti from Sheffield Hallam University. And the title of her uh, talk next week is Lessons from Britain's Asian Youth Movements. Um, so we will be sending out the um, link and the Eventbrite uh, very soon, actually tonight or tomorrow. So you'll be able to start registering for that too. And as usual, I would like to thank Kim, Kim Triton, uh, for wonderful work in um, um, being, you know, in, in making this possible and in uh, organizing the event so brilliantly. So thank you, Kim, uh, as usual. Um, and uh, I guess if, um, if no one has other things to say uh, or to ask, which we, we have already asserted, uh, there are no more questions. I would like to just uh, wish everyone a very good evening and uh, see you next week. And thank you again, Christine. Thank you so much for having me and for the engagement and, and great questions from you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. There, there's some clapping going on. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. We will send around the recording um, of today's um, event via email. And um, in that email, we will include the um, sign up for the next event. Um, and we'll also include a, um, a schedule of all of the uh, remaining events as well. Um, and with the recording, you'll get both the re recording and also the um, chat box. So again, it may be that you kind of read back through that and you think of some more kind of um, questions and areas to engage with. And um, all of these, uh, these seminars are on uh, different aspects uh, within um, migration and diaspora, but there's definitely some um, key kind of inter uh, interconnections and intersections within them. So. Um, even if you if you haven't been able to raise a question today or a question comes to you um, later, it might be something that's relevant to another one of our sessions as well. So do feel free to engage um, as much as possible with them um, and also engage with, uh, with the um, Centre for Migration and Diaspora in more detail. We'll send out also um, the link to uh, the Facebook page for the Centre. Um, and again, it might be kind of worth a, a good scroll through that if you haven't already done so. And, um, there's lots of interesting, um, interesting information and topics on there that you might want to engage with further. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. And thanks, Kim. Good night. Thank you. Good night. night. <laughs>